Hello, my name is Brendan Ferguson. I'm a designer and writer. This is Dave Grossman, the lead designer slash writer. And David Bogan, art director. And Heather Logis, I did production on episode one and design and writing for others. <laughs> So for the opening credits, I was uh, I was real worried about this sequence because I always like games to start off really exciting and get right into it. Uh, but then Jake Jake Rodkin made up this great credit sequence, and I was blown away when I saw it. I said, "Now I don't even want to play the game. I just want to watch the credits all day long." <laughs> <laughs> I agree. It's very uh, very styly, very nice feel to it. I love it. And that is a pretty wall. And I love that title. <laughs> I lobbied hard for the tire track on that wall. Yeah, I kept pushing for that tire track on the wall. I think Kim was of the opinion, that really doesn't make sense. <laughs> but uh, ultimately, illogic prevailed. I got it, I got it. Hello? I think there's a lot of stuff on that Hey, back where's wall. the phone? We don't get to see often either. <laughs> like the pin the tail all over Max. <clears throat> So for this first part, uh, we wanted to make a little sequence to start the season off where you could kind of have a little low-pressure scene to kind of learn how to play the game and get used to the characters. So we thought it might be fun just to start off with a, a little case right in your own office where the natural way to start would be, your phone's gone, I can't even start the case proper because I want to get that phone. And so uh, we invented the character of Jimmy Two Teeth the Rat, who would kidnap your phone and launch us off on our quest. Digestion. Your passages? So we knew from the very beginning that we were wanted to have uh, Hugh Bliss be involved with the plot in some way. So we just wanted to put some little thing right at the beginning so that you could see Hugh Bliss or his influence throughout every episode. Something hopefully that if you went back later and played it, it would be fun to see that on your second pass. Have no fears. We did get some letters from Scientologists on, on that point. I rate letters. I wrote a few of them just for <laughs> Are we happy about that? <laughs> Are you happy to see letters? I love letters. If you don't I'm offend anyone, you problem. haven't said anything. <laughs> Agreed. He'll be the death of us all. Where is this Lilliputian agitator? Are you blind? He's right there. Bosco just turned out to be a really excellent, uh, excellent character. We fly the uh, fly the voice actor up from LA because he's good. <laughs> it's uh, it's fun to watch him develop over. All six episodes, he really just gets pretty crazy near the end. And he was one of the characters in the first episode that you really designed yourself, yeah. Dave. Yeah, um, I worked with Steve Purcell. Uh, Steve wanted to get some really odd shapes for the character and different colors. We tried to stay away from real colors, just get some really crazy. He's got kind of a muted purple kind of skin. It doesn't show up so well on some monitors, but keep it cartoony. So it was planned from the beginning that this season would kind of trace a sort of conspiracy, be a parody of all sorts of conspiracy theories, and just kind of build and build. And so Bosco was kind of the voice of seeming absurdity in the things that he would say, but a lot of the, the things that he was scared of would turn out to be true. And actually, in the very first episode, you can hear him list out your nemeses over the next five episodes, vaguely, when he's listing all the things that he's scared about. Aliens, sentient computers, and so on. These Soda Papa characters uh, started out as just mechanics for puzzles. They were just sort of people to be in your way in the first episode. And uh, we just wound up having a lot of a lot of traction with them. We kept bringing them back episode after episode and uh, kind of building them up more and more, uh, despite the objections of various people. <laughs> I think we also uh, successfully created the most ugly character in video games, his wizard. <laughs> but we love him, but even when he pees himself. They're so lovable, even though they're kind of freakish. Can you believe we get paid for this? We're a little worried about this one, just the uh, the idea of knocking a bowling ball out of a window onto somebody's head in a game that you know might be conceivably played by impressionable young children or impressionable young adults. Someone might try that at home. Don't do that, kids. I tried it, and let me say, not as fun as it looks. 
Uh, yeah, we actually did kind of think for a while about what would be the appropriate <coughs> object to drop out. And we, I think the bowling ball does kind of give that sort of classic cartoony sense to the violence that most people are not actually repulsed, sickened, and vomit after watching this. That works at six. Peepers, this is going to hurt us a lot more than it's going to hurt you. Just There's also this um, ongoing conversation with Steve about what is okay for Sam and Max to actually do. Like, what... They're supposed to be good guys, even though they're, they're kind of obnoxious and... Good, right? you know. He did make the point that they are technically on the side of justice and, and, and goodness. <laughs> right. And uh, specifically with the uh, the scene, I don't think we have any clips of it, the, uh, the, the driving. Oh, oh no, oh, here we no, go. I guess we do. Go cruise for lawbreakers. Um, he wanted it to be such that uh, if you were going to pull people over and extort money out of them, that those people had to be uh, nefarious felons in some way, as opposed to just ordinary citizens. Right. So we uh, theme this as white collar crime <clears throat> drive. So you get the impression that those pe these though these people may be mild mannered, they're actually terrible people, worthy of stealing ten thousand dollars from. <laughs> At and the beginning of this shot here, uh, you can see that it was a little bit dark. I just wanted to point out that over time we got better uh, with lighting the environments with our light limitations uh, from uh, 360 degrees. Uh, this early episode was an example of where we were starting to find problems and we had to create if we solve in the rest of the episodes. You can see they're a little dark in the front of their faces there. What are you talking about? This also was an interesting experiment in trying to include action elements in a, a license that sort of calls to have some exciting driving and shooting, but which is being done in a very um, passive gameplay style. We wanted to not get too far away from the sort of point-and-click puzzle-solving uh, methods of, of most of the game. So you drive this car by pointing and clicking, and it's kind of a strange way to drive a car. <laughs> <laughs> it is strange. I mean, we were considering lots of different ways of doing this. We wanted to, to leave it open so they had the possibility of using different items and trying different things that you wouldn't normally do. <laughs> nice. Loved a monkey. <laughs> <laughs> this reminds me of that place where Aunt Trudy lives with the medicine smell and the rubber sheets and the enormous mute Indian. Sounds like a million laughs. Yeah, mostly after. So we built up this uh, in the first half of episode one. The idea was that you have this sense of there's this person that keeps being referred to that you never see. So we're hoping to build up the mystery of this guy and has this grand entrance here. And then, of course, capped out by perhaps the ugliest rendition of a song I've ever heard. <laughs> Still waiting to hear the real version of that song. Wow, evil plans really do work. Don't get too excited, Stretch Pants. The freelance police are here. Yes, actually. I've been waiting for you. Really? Next time, try leaving the front door open. Save us all some grief. Allow me to explain. <laughs> Uh-oh. I think we just triggered a soliloquy. Good thing I have the attention span of a pint of yak butter. I never wanted much. This was the uh, first cutscene, the first big major cutscene that we did um, in our in-house Telltale tool. Uh, it's quite a bit different than animating in a traditional sense within a package like Maya or any of the other big packages. In the big packages you have, you know, control right down to the, the very minute detail, you know, finger wiggles and extreme you know, timing, control, all that kind of thing. But in our tool that we use in-house, uh, to get across cutscenes that have uh, extremely long-winded Sam and Max dialogue, which is awesome, um, uh, there's no time to do that in Maya. You would be lip-syncing for, for weeks to get the entire scene animated. Uh, we move the camera right around in the engine and basically create the cutscene that way. So it's quite a bit different than animating in Maya. It's kind of like a very, very complicated set of Legos. <laughs> yeah. That move. I would like you to push Sam Lego. play. <laughs> Sam Lego would be cool. I still want Max plush doll. Uh -oh. Either I just walked into Me the and the rest of the internet. Max Museum, or I'm dreaming. We just got a glimpse Someday. of my uh, favorite character in all of Sam Max, that being Brady Max, 
<laughs> Brandy Max. Max is pretty sad. I think this uh, this little sequence turned out really well. Um, we had no idea what we were going to end up with and how far we could push our engine into creating this illusion of being in a dream. <laughs> but we have the uh, the kind of the foggy border and strange strangeness going on outside the doors and the windows and floating heads, of course. This was a really fun process, actually, because John Scro. We kind of just said, okay, see what you can do, and he threw a bunch of ideas at us visually, and we got to pick which ones that seemed most like they would work best. And my, yeah, most of them are in there. Brady Culture was a strangely unpopular character uh, with the fans <laughs> after this came out, and I, I wasn't sure whether to feel good or bad about that since he's the villain, <laughs> not supposed to like him. Yeah, I don't quite understand it myself. <laughs> I like him, but hey, I designed him, so. <laughs> I keep trying to bring him back. Somehow. <laughs> His hair is in the rest of them. That's right. Rest of the episodes. <laughs> I'm sure you all remember the commands. <laughs> so now, my foolish pawn. There's a the first appearance of uh I guess it's not actually technically the first appearance of the, of the rope that we use tying up Max up there on the uh <laughs> That's not the first organ. appearance of that. <laughs> strangely difficult to do ropes in in, in 3D. It's in a telltale staple. <laughs> the rope bag. I tried to send you semaphore signals with my ears, but you know how I always get the K and the V mixed up. They skipped over that puzzle. Well, I guess we That was a forceps again and be on our way. Let me! You know how I That was a tricky one, as I recall from uh playtest. Yeah, we we tried to make the uh try to make the last puzzle of the the trickiest of the game. Uh, it seems like every time when we have the play tests, which are a couple weeks before we ship the game, we're, we're never ready with the very last puzzle, and so everyone always says the very last one is the worst, because <laughs> it doesn't work, as, as mentioned. Putting people inside televisions is a lot more difficult than it sounds. <laughs> Uh, that's actually a full-scale character um, with his legs hanging out from underneath the television set. We had to make sure we cropped the camera to uh, to get him in there. That's how real televisions actually work. <laughs> Sometimes, yes. That's it. 